Hi everyone, this video is for section 6.2, graphs of the other trig functions. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at number 9, which is located on page 376 of your textbook. So the particular function that we have here is m of x is equal to 6 times the cosecant of pi thirds x plus pi. So before we begin to do any heavy work, let's go ahead and uh, clean up our function. That's going to help us identify um, some key features that we want to include in our graph. So I'm going to go ahead and write the function again down here. And one of the first things that we want to do before identifying any of our components is to factor out uh, the inside of what's happening in the cosecant. So our goal here is essentially we want to get x alone or we want to have um, x have a coefficient of 1 is the more appropriate thing to say here. So that means that I have to factor out a pi thirds from both of those terms. So if I remove a pi thirds from pi thirds x, I'm just left with x. If I factor out a pi thirds from pi, that's going to leave me with 3. Okay, so <clears throat> if you don't believe me, please feel free to take a moment and pause the video and redistribute pi thirds back into that quantity. You should get pi thirds x plus pi back. Okay, now we can go ahead and start identifying some pieces of our graph. First off, our midline, remember, is um, dealing with our vertical shift. So if we are moving up or down, and it's usually tacked on at the very end of your function. So in this case, I don't see anything. So essentially, I'm saying that my midline is zero. I'm not moving it up or down. This also means that we can go ahead and put our midline in right on top of the x-axis. Bear with me. So the next thing that we want to go ahead and do is let's take a look at amplitude. So amplitude is going to be the value that is going to be our vertical stretch or compression here. So in this case, we're doing a vertical stretch since um, it is greater than one. So our amplitude here is going to be six. The next thing that we want to do is go ahead and find the period. Um, the very fact that we took the time to go ahead and factor things out, it reveals to us our, um, in this case, our horizontal stretch. So this is going to be b is equal to pi thirds. So if you recall, our horizontal stretch or compression is uh, connected to our period. b is equal to 2 pi over the period. Well, I can go ahead and use substitution here to drop that pi thirds in for b. So now I have a proportion. I have pi thirds is equal to 2 pi over p. And a quick way to help us with proportions is we could do a cross multiplication. This is going to give us p times pi is equal to 6 pi. And then dividing both sides by pi will give us p is equal to 6. Okay, So we are actually pretty lucky here because now what we can go ahead and do is we can use what we know about the period to help us determine what kind of scaling we should use for our x-axis. Um, remember, I linked the period to represent the four quadrants uh, on your unit circle because four quadrants results in one full rotation or one revolution around that unit circle. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to take the 6 and I'm going to divide it by 4. Remember, this is representing the four quadrants. So this fraction simplifies down to 3 and a half. So basically we're saying that um, after every 3 and a half units, I've moved into a new quadrant. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of indicate that on my graph now. I'm going to go ahead and do my scaling by a half because I think that that's going to be relatively easy for me to follow um, as opposed to doing everything on a scale of 
on an exact scale of one half or one and a half, I mean, excuse me. Oop. Have to be careful. Okay, and while I'm here, I'm also gonna go ahead and do the amplitude. And I'm gonna do the amplitude um, on the y-axis as a scale of one, but to prevent it from being so crowded looking on this page, I'm going to skip every other tick mark and do my labeling. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put up that the period is 6 just to fill that out. And again, it is coincidence in this case that our amplitude and our period are the same value. Uh, it just so happens to be the case in this problem. Okay, so now let's talk about um, our start here. Well, we know that we're dealing with a cosecant fun function, and we know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. A sine function starts at the center, and I'm going to put center in quotation marks, or we can say midline. So what I'm saying here is that usually if we didn't have any sort of shift, we would start right here where I've indicated my point in orange, on the midline, and in this case it just so happens to be at the origin. However, we have a plus 3 that has been added inside this cosecant function. This tells us that we actually need to move everything to the left three units. So from this orange dot, uh, let's undo, oops, let's undo that. Nope. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead and, uh, sorry about that. So starting at this point, we would want to move it three units. So our starting point is actually going to be at the negative three. So I'm going to clean that up so we don't have to see too much of a mess. And I'm just going to drop my starting point right here. Okay, I've indicated it with the pink dot. Okay, so from here, we can go ahead and plot the rest of this. I know that from the starting point, since this cosecant is positive, in other words, there is no negative hanging out in front of the 6 here, I'm going to proceed upward. So I'm going to go to the right 1.5 units, and I'm going to mirror that amplitude of 6. Then I'm going to go another 1.5 units back to the midline followed by another one and a half units down six. That point's kind of all over the place, sorry about that. Then another one and a half units back to the midline. Another one and a half units up six. And then another one and a half units back to the midline. And then we could also go in reverse if we wanted to fill in um, the values past negative 3. So if I wanted to go to the left 1.5 units, I would be down 6. Okay, and then I could go another 1.5 units back to the midline. Okay, so... We're basically just going to create a recessed sine function here, hence the reason why I'm using a dotted and as opposed to a solid line. Okay, From here, we've actually taken care of the hardest part. We're really just going to add in a little bit more structure, and then we're going to sketch in our cosecant graph. So anywhere that we see the sine function cutting through the midline is actually where our asymptotes are going to be. The reason being is that at these spots, this is when our sine function would equal zero. Since the cosecant function is the reciprocal, that would mean that we would be putting a zero in the denominator um, of 
our uh, of our function, which would mean that we can't we can't have that. That's an illegal step. So we have to go ahead and put in asymptotes here. Okay. Okay. I know our graph looks pretty messy, but we're almost done. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight those points that are where the maximum and minimum of our sine function is. And that actually tells us how to sketch in the cosecant. We have the asymptotes that act as barriers. We also have this recessed sine function to act as a barrier as well. So it kind of tells us that we have no choice but to sketch our function like so. And there you have it. Here is our rough sketch of our cosecant function. All right, I hope this was helpful. If you do have any other questions, please let me know.